This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Gentlemen, welcome. Um, on International Women's Day, it's just been pointed out to me that uh, we are doing extremely well because, of course, we have an all-female panel this evening to address you. On the topic of surveillance and human rights, this is the third seminar that the Institute of Commonwealth Studies has organized on the topic of surveillance and human rights, which, of course, is very much in the news, very much before um, current parliament, and indeed deserves uh, both uh, focus and discussion because of its topic topicality. I'm Dr. Sue Onslow. I'm a senior lecturer in the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our two speakers on the panel this evening, and of course, Dr. Judith Townend uh, from the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, who will be the discussant today. Um, I, as I say, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, after the panel has have made their reflections and comments, we will be opening it to questions from the floor, and I will be asking you, please, each of you to introduce yourselves uh, by name and also institution, because we are recording this for a podcast to go up on the website. Um, the first speaker on today's panel will be Kirsty Brimelow, QC, um, who has, of course, a very considerable um, background. She specializes in international human rights law, criminal law, public, international, constitutional, and international criminal <laughs> law, in addition to being an extremely experienced trial barrister. Um, she has defended uh, defendants and acted for claimants as both a junior and also as Queen's Counsel. Um, she was, of course, made silk in 2011, um, and has also um, uh, appeared before courts of criminal and civil courts, respectively, in England and Wales, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, Court Martials and Courts of Appeal in the Caribbean, Court of Appeal in the British Virgin Islands, the European Court of Human Rights, and the High Court of Gibraltar. So as you would see, that's very much both an international and also Commonwealth span. Um, she frequently advises before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, the ECOWAS Court in Abuja, Nigeria, the Court of Appeal of Nigeria, and the Superior Tribunal of Santander, Colombia. Um, she represented Amnesty International before the Investigatory Powers Tribunal in its complaint that data collection programs PRISM, Upstream, and Tempora, as revealed by the US whistleblower Edward Snowden, were in breach of articles <coughs> under the, human rights, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, Silky Carlo joined Liberty in November of 2015, and she's been working on the draft investigatory powers bill, contributing to Liberty's expert legal policy and technical analysis. Before joining Liberty, Silky provided technical training to journalists and lawyers at risk and worked for Edward Snowden's official defense fund. So we're extremely fortunate to have such a wealth of knowledge, both practical and also, you could say, <coughs> academic, a, a really profound understanding of challenges uh, that face human rights um, with the current climate and drift of legislation on surveillance. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kirsty to you. Um, so I would ask you to join me in welcoming you. Thank you very much um, for the introduction. The sort of probably key, key words there are um, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal uh, and also Mr Snowden um, because that has really led to where we are um, today. So I uh, represented Amnesty International in a case um, brought in 2014 together with Liberty, Privacy International and some other uh, NGOs against GCHQ and security, other security services in relation to the revelations by Edward Snowden. There he is, um, taken a few years ago. But um, he had revealed, you may recall, in June 2013 that uh, there were uh, bulk um, data collection programs or mass data collection programs and they were called PRISM, Upstream, and Tempera. PRISM and Upstream being the US 
uh, programmes and TEMPRA being the UK ones. Now, um, the UK uh, adopts uh, an approach of neither confirm nor deny, and that has remained the position, uh, even though in the United States um, there was a different approach, and both um, Barack Obama and James Clapper, who was the United States Director of National Intelligence, have publicly confirmed the existence of these programmes. So already it's quite interesting you have two different um, approaches um, from those two countries. But what happened in this case was that um, we all proceeded on um, the basis of premises. So um, the premises were uh, led to certain questions. So we, we proceeded on the basis that these programmes existed and um, <coughs> therefore uh, the complaint was that they effectively circumvented the law, that the technology had outstripped REPA, which is the act, or was the act, um, which was governing um, issues of interception of people's data. And obviously the relevant European uh, convention articles that were applicable were um, Article 8 in particular, so the right to privacy, uh, and uh, so Article 8, 1, and also Article 10, freedom of expression. There was also another argument in there in relation to Article 14, saying in fact there was some discrimination because of the way the technology worked, in that it was more likely to uh, be used more effectively if you were outside the jurisdiction, in that the uh, authorities didn't need to gain a warrant, whereas if you were inside the jurisdiction, so therefore um, not a foreigner in general terms, then uh, there was further protections. So that was it in summary. Um, this is just me showing off my PowerPoint, so I'll just move on another slide. The Investigative Powers Tribunal. Now, a lot of you might not have heard of it, or you might have heard of it only more recently. Actually, it's been around a long time. It was set up in 2000, um, but it, it had a reputation when we were all going there as practitioners. We did all note that there had not been one single finding against a UK security uh, or, uh, and or intelligence service. So um, it, made, it had upheld some complaints. It had upheld some complaints, but not against security services. Uh, and giving the game away, there was some success in this case. So the first time there was a ruling against the UK security services was actually last February. Um, the body itself actually really came out of the shadows in 2003. Uh, not, the, not the fault of this oversight body, that's where you go, I and mean, anyone can go with a complaint if you think that your data is being intercepted. Um, there's no cost risk. You can make a complaint and then it's all reviewed. But when it was first set up, it was very much done under a closed process. Uh, and um, it has now evolved so that um, pretty much everything, as much as it can, is conducted in open process. Although during our hearing, um, there had to be some closed hearings. So there it is, the chairman is still, the president rather, is still um, Michael Burton QC, who's obviously an experienced uh, High Court judge and um, civil QC. What is interesting is that there's no avenue to appeal, and also with this investigatory, appeals, uh, investigatory powers tribunal, there's no um, avenue uh, for judicial review. Um, this is one of the recommendations, in fact, that David Anderson made, that this should be at least subject to judicial review, so you don't have the one option, if you fail here, of then waiting another five years to get before the European Court of Human Rights. So, um, there we were, and uh, it's very easy to find the judgments. They're on the website, um, and those were the complaints. So the first judgment 
was that there was no violations of Articles 8 or 10 for soliciting, receiving, storing, transmitting private communications of UK residents obtained by the US authorities, and that there were no violations for intercepting private communications. So that was the um, first judgment. However, what had happened during the hearing was that there was disclosure of a sort of signposting as to what the guidelines were on sharing data, because one of the big issues was that data is shared between the UK and the US, and the complaint was um, that it was not in accordance with the law, um, generally because it breached your basic rule of law principles in that uh, the sharing was arbitrary and not foreseeable. So um, there was an issue with transparency as to how the sharing was taking place. So disclosure was ordered in relation to what framework there was for sharing of data with the US. And so this resulted in the second judgment from the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, which basically said um, there had been a breach, um, but now that it had all been clarified, it was all okay. So that was the sort of Pyrrhic victory, if you like, in February 2015, that until this um, disclosure, um, that, uh, that there um, was unlawfulness. So there it is. Prior to the disclosures made, the regime governing the soliciting, receiving, storing, transmitting by UK authorities obtained um, by the US uh, authorities pursuant to PRISM Upstream contravened Articles 8 or 10. Silky's going to speak more of this, but what's quite interesting in the new Investigatory Powers Bill is that, that, that there has been a further move um, in relation to data sharing, uh, and there's a further restriction in relation to it, and um, a, an obligation upon the UK not to encourage sharing of data where the US hasn't obtained it under a warrant. So um, that was some victory, because actually that was probably tell was my part of the argument, I felt very strongly about it, um, that um, all this was, was going on and we didn't, there wasn't really much proportionality to it. So um, that was the judgment. Um, one thing for the lawyers amongst you, um, in terms of those you're interested in particularly case law, uh, Malone is still, still remains um, a very useful one to refer to because Quite often the argument you will get in terms of when you're making um, European Convention submissions that there's been a breach is because these are qualified rights, obviously uh, then you, you're having the argument, well this is in accordance with the law, here is our law. Um, but obviously just having a law doesn't mean, doesn't satisfy the Convention. What you need to look at is the quality of the law and that's made very clear, clear in Malone, so it's not going to be compatible if your law is such where um, it allows um, arbitrary conduct, um, or such as particularly where you have powers exercised in secret, so that's always very important. And um, the law itself must be foreseeable, and not so that it's going to enable your serious criminal or, terror or potential terrorist to adapt conduct um, what it means is that the law must be sufficiently clear. Uh, another case, um, Bykoff and Russia, uh, again this is cited a lot by those of us who practice in this area, uh, where it says very succinctly, consequently the law must indicate the scope of any such discretion conferred on the competent authorities and the manner of <coughs> exercise with sufficient clarity to give the individual adequate protection against arbitrary interference. And so the very crux of this case actually was quite a lot of fun because we would take examples over the five-day hearing of, well, if I had a Nokia telephone and I decided to um, email uh, or rather text, um, say, Silky, on a, who also is using a Nokia, well, that message to Silk is going to bounce off a, a, a mask round here, a telephone mask round here. However, if I decide to use my iPhone or try and 
send her a message via Facebook, it's going to go via a server in California to Silky's phone, and so it doesn't have those protections um, that my text message would have in that that would require a warrant for interception, um, and, and that was one of the issues, it, depending on what, what device you're using. Um, and basically my emails can get scooped up in California under bulk collection programs. Um, so that was um, the sort of Pyrrhic victory in relation to amnesty, um, that there was then a finding that in fact there had been a legal um, interception as well of amnesties. Um, uh, well, actually this was a further um, part, it's actually June last year, uh, that there was also a find, uh, on the fact-finding part, that there were, had been illegal interceptions by the UK of amnesty's communications. Um, now that actually related to time of storage, in that um, it was held that, in fact, the uh, security service breached their own guidelines <coughs> by holding the uh, intercepted data for too long. So again, it wasn't such a major, um, perhaps a, a major judgment in that respect. However, um, it very much brought this all up to light, into the light. So, um, the, and there was no determination on privacy international, I ought to mention liberty, because we <laughs> still here, so no, no determination on those. So this led, fast forward to June last year, we then have David Anderson's report, which I really recommend, a question of trust. It's about, it's quite, it's quite lengthy, I think it's about 267 pages, but um, if you're having a bad night sleeping, um, have, have a go. Uh, but a question of trust, and it's very, very good. I mean, he's, um, he's very incisive. It called for a, a basically start from scratch with the laws, because actually getting to grips with repo is such a complex, dense um, uh, set of uh, legislation that um, he also said, you need to start again. Um, but he did also support that the UK intelligence agencies should be allowed to retain intrusive powers to gather uh, bulk communications data. And that has found its way into the same, into the bill. And this is one of the things that causes a lot of concern for NGOs who say that this bulk uh, collection um, really should stop or there should be further safeguards and there still remains complaints um, particularly uh, I think probably from Liberty you'll hear about that but certainly from Privacy International as well that the safeguards um, are insufficient. Um, so there's an example of another NGO um, welcoming Anderson's report English Pen but saying uh, it could go even further but uh, one key recommendation from Anderson was that there needed to be judicial oversight. And some of you may have heard some of the politicians pushing back uh, on um, some of the, the media, particularly in Radio 4, the Today programme, saying uh, judges are too slow, et cetera, et cetera, which of course is nonsense. And one essential thing when you have powers, particularly those which are being uh, conducted in, in a secret way, um, you really need independent, rigorous oversight. So the new legislation, well, the draft was November 2015. I'm only going to touch on it. Um, and then there was three parliamentary reports, all expressing concerns about the draft. So then you have a revised and published, um, a revised um, bill published in the 1st of March 2016, so not very long ago. And it said it had taken into account the concerns raised in the three parliamentary reports. Um, however, um, Privacy International particularly pointed out that all it's done is changed the title General Protections to General Privacy Protections um, in terms of comparators looking at safeguards. So it said, you know, this is a, a political trick. Um, there's actually no change here. And they've completely disregarded these three reports through, the par through Parliament with various concerns. Uh, and those are, those are the sort of list of what's actually going to be in there, what is in there, bulk surveillance powers still there, but with bulk warrants. Mass bulk equipment interference, I mean, I love that phrase, it's basically hacking in any other language, but um, that's, uh, that, that can be um, authorised and is, it, and is um, 
a, a, a very concerning development. Um, there's no details of the type of operations that would justify the use of, of the bulk powers, and that's one concern that's been raised by the um, one of the oversight bodies, the Intelligence Security um, Commission. Uh, as I said, there is a restriction now on intelligence sharing, which is a great thing. Another controversial aspect is that <coughs> internet service providers now um, are to retain their records for 12 months. So that, again, has caused um, a lot of concern. Um, oversight, just very briefly in the last few minutes I have. I mean, oversight is, is, is so essential. And um, <coughs> I, uh, I, in this case, I, I very much took on criticising the oversight um, as they were, and um, I, 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 in the in the judgment, um, the judgment uh, actually said, uh, Mr. Justice Burton said uh, that notwithstanding my critique, he said we are satisfied that the uh, oversight is robustly independent, etc., etc. Um, happily for me, it's one of those rare moments that I. I've had in the last 20 odd years. Um, David Anderson agreed that the oversight was not robust enough. So there have, but there are reforms in relation to these three bodies, although the three bodies remain the same. So those are your um, Intelligence Security Committee. Uh, those of you who are already know quite a bit about this, you may recall that there was already reforms after the Binyam Mohammed case, because obviously this was all going on. Um, where there was uh, rendition, torture, and so on, and all this was supposedly being robustly um, reviewed by these oversight bodies, but nobody had a clue, it seems, as to what was going on. So then there was a reform, and it was that that the IPT said, well, that is sufficient, but David Anderson said, there must be more, um, and there is more reform. So just a little description of what they do. Your Interception of C Communications Commissioner, uh, well, he um, reports to the Prime Minister and uh, keeps under review, and you can, uh, his reports are um, public, uh, so you can, you can read um, those reports, and uh, has various powers uh, to, to demand uh, material and to review the material. Uh, the Intelligence and Security Committee, now that has, as I say, it's been emasculated after the Binyam Mohammed case. Uh, it didn't even used to have any powers to summon, so it would be sort of saying, you know, ca can you explain this? And, and nobody, was, nobody was turning up from the security services to assist. So um, that has been changed, and also the membership was changed as well, so there would be membership from both House of Commons and House of Lords. Um, however, it's not responsible for reviewing ongoing and current operations conducted. Um, so these were his uh, recommendations on improving oversight. Uh, again, it's including bringing in judicial authorisation. So that is a, a major step in the new bill uh, and long overdue. Um, this basically is the first review of this legislation, sort of root and branch review um, for 15 Years. I mean, you may recall the sort of um, rather dismal and failed so-called <coughs> snoopers charter from a couple of years ago. So it is very significant. I've obviously put oversight mechanisms in because just for purely egotistical purposes, right, right at number one. Um, so um, th those are his uh, recommendations. Now, in terms of the, the, the general um, the, the general discussions back and forth as to why all this matters, uh, as was said in my introduction, I also um, practice it internationally as well as in this country. Uh, and one thing I, I found, which some of you may know, is that um, the UK uh, and India uh, have been named as the worst online spies uh, in the world. Now, it doesn't mean like bad spies, it just means prolific. And uh, they were named um, by the NGO Reporters Without Borders for implementing censorship and surveillance. Uh, India has at least two surveillance regimes um, in uncertain stages of preparation, 
called the Central Monitoring System, which provides for the collection of telephone metadata by tapping into the telecommunications company's records and NETRA, which is a dragnet surveillance <coughs> system. Uh, and India, uh, as it's inherited a common law jurisdiction, frequently relies upon foreign judgments in the interpretation of <coughs> its laws, and hence it looks to the UK as well as to European uh, decisions. Um, recently, I was actually in India December last year, and I had a little look into all of this, and um, I found that the Attorney General in July of last year had said that the right to privacy has always been a vague concept and a subject of varying conclusions from the Supreme Court. Uh, and so he told a, a three bench, uh, a three judge bench, that the constitution makers had never intended to make privacy a fundamental right. Um, he then, in another case subsequently, um, uh, changed his submission and, and said, said he's never said that the right to privacy was vague and actually, of course, is fundamentally important. So um, the, the interesting case is People's Union for Civil Liberties against the Union of India, 1997. Um, uh, uh, other cases on surveillance, those of you who are interested in India, Karak Singh against the um, state of Uttar Pradesh, 1964, and then Gobind against the state of MP 1975. Now, the one thing that often rages in the media is, well, if I'm just using text, uh, um, WhatsApp, Facebook, um, in a normal way where I'm not uh, seeking to commit um, atrocities or harm anyone, <coughs> why, why should it matter? Why should it matter if my communications are, are scooped up um, along with the bad people, and that might actually help to stop um, future atrocities? Well. The uh, information on how much it does help, does stop future atrocities, um, is fairly uh, opaque, first of all. Um, however, uh, there also is the um, history that we, we have very much in our head, our recent history, uh, of, uh, of organisations such as the Stasi in East Germany and so on, where the, the rights that have then come out of never wanting to be in that sort of um, uh, environment again, uh, those rights have been fiercely held on to. And it's very easy, isn't it, to lose what you have gained um, over time, uh, very easy to lose it very quickly. Uh, and basically, when technology circumvents the law, um, abuse of power is never very far away. So um, ultimately, freedoms that we want protected, um, they really are those which we should be scrutinising and uh, fight strongly for. Thank you very much. Kirsty, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a real uh, privilege to be, to be here. Um, and to follow on from Kirsty, and in fact, following quite perfectly because um, I'm going to be speaking about the Investigatory Powers Bill and about why um, your right to privacy matters. Um, it <coughs> feels strange to be speaking about why privacy matters. Um, I sometimes catch myself because I suppose um, previous to the Snowden revelations, at least I felt it was something that we all cherished and understood, and that we understood why mass surveillance was a bad thing. Um, but here we are in 2016 making the arguments against mass surveillance. Um, it's quite astonishing. So at the moment, the Investigatory Powers Bill um, is going through Parliament. And um, as you'd appreciate, especially following Kirsty's talk, um, it is thanks to Edward Snowden that this piece of legislation is even in Parliament. Uh, because prior to his uh, very courageous whistleblowing, we had absolutely no idea um, uh, about what was really going on. And, and by we, I don't just mean us, I mean Parliament, um, to some extent, even the Intelligence um, and Security Committee too. Um, so I, in my opinion, there um, was certainly a sense of lawlessness around the agencies, um, which I would also suggest uh, to some extent continues. Um, and this crisis for dem our democracy is continuing now, 
um, not only because the powers in the investigatory powers bill are so extreme, <coughs> uh, but because it is uh, the, the bill is being rushed through Parliament. Um, it's not being subjected to proper scrutiny. There isn't proper time for parliamentarians to analyse it. Obviously, in the parliamentary calendar at the moment, um, things are quite busy. We've got elections, we've got the EU referendum. Um, it's hard enough for parliamentarians to engage with the issue, but now is a particularly difficult time. Um, so, again, um, we, have a real, we have a real challenge on our hands. And as much as the Investigatory Powers Bill is an opportunity, um, and we have um, at liberty for a long time um, campaigned for there to be new comprehensive surveillance legislation um, this is not the right piece of legislation at all um, so I'll describe um, a little bit about what's in it uh, for those of you um, who, who might not have read all uh, 300 very engaging pages I would, I would encourage anyone to do that um, but there are extraordinary bulk powers in there um, that can only be described as mass surveillance, um, whatever the, the double speak that uh, Theresa May tries to um, give to the press, they are mass surveillance powers. Um, there are powers to force communication service providers to um, store in bulk communications data. Um, the, uh, so that's who you contact, when you contact them, uh, location data potentially. Uh, not just of phones but emails um, and now as mentioned uh, your, your what, what are being called internet connection records as well so it's like an abbreviated version of your internet history and actually more so as we have more devices that connect to the internet uh, internet connection records won't just mean your browsing it will mean all the other gadgets you have that connect to the internet um, so they will be stored in bulk and they can go to the agencies in bulk um, as uh, <coughs> Dan Sch Schmidt from uh, of the starts, he said, uh, don't ever think that, that data is there, uh, that information is there not to be used. Uh, the purpose of collecting this information is to use it and the agencies analyse it in bulk uh, and process all this data too um, to look for things they think are interesting. Um, there's also the powerful bulk interception of all our communications. It's supposed to be um, of external communications, but as Claire pointed out, um, in the context of the internet and modern communications, external doesn't mean very much. Um, it, the, the example of us sending each other a Facebook message is, is a perfect one. Uh, that would be an external communication. Um, hacking powers, um, including the ability to hack um, in bulk, um, which even the Intelligence and Security Committee said was uh, extreme and, and unnecessary, uh, in other words, and that that power should be removed, but it remains in the bill. And also an interesting new uh, power, well, new to legislation, but, but not new to practice, unfortunately, um, to collect bulk personal data sets. Uh, these bulk personal data sets are basically large data sets of information on you uh, that could be from anywhere, really. Uh, there's very little limit. There's, there's not really any limits in the legislation about where these data sets could be sourced from. What we do know it, uh, from Intelligence and Security Committee, um, and that most of their, some of their reports are redacted, um, but what we did know, what we did find out about bulk personal data sets is that they include information on medical conditions, political opinions, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, and the list goes on. Uh, these are also, those data sets are also analysed, processed. Uh, they are used for two purposes, uh, for several purposes, two of which I'm particularly concerned about. Uh, one being that they are used to generate suspects. Um, bear in mind as well that internet, internet connection records um, are already being collected in another form by the intelligence agencies. Uh, the, the powers in the, in the investigatory powers bill are for um, the police, 
to to have them and for internet providers to generate them themselves. Uh, so there's a, a slight technical difference there. Uh, but internet connection records in bulk, as they're currently collected through interception by the agencies, are fed into these bulk <coughs> personal data sets too. So that's used to generate suspects. Uh, the other thing that bulk personal data sets are used for um, is uh, eerily uh, to identify people who might be good informants. It's, uh, it's quite unbelievable. So, um, why do we need to care about privacy? Well, hopefully, in light of a description about the powers, um, the question kind of answers itself. But it is interesting to see how post Snowden, the mantra of nothing to hide, nothing to fear, has resurfaced. Uh, I, I guess a lot of us feel uh, quite disempowered sometimes, um, and that's the only response that we can have. Um, but it's one that I think um, is not a helpful one. As Edward Snowden said, um, if you say that uh, you have nothing to hide and therefore nothing to fear, that's like saying, uh, I don't care about free speech because I've got nothing to say. It doesn't really follow. Um, and of course, that's our, our, our civil liberties. Uh, the purpose of our civil, li civil liberties is to draw a red line around basic freedoms that we know we need to maintain a healthy democracy. I also think that the phrase nothing to hide, nothing to fear um, is a postulation that, that suggests that you yourself are not personally at risk and therefore you abstain from further analysis. And I don't think that's acceptable. We can talk about some of the, some of the groups who are at particular risk, although I would suggest that we all are in the health of our society and democracy is. Um, and th another problem with the um, stance of, of nothing to hide is the word hide, which suggests a uh, kind of uh, shame or criminality of wanting to keep something private, um, which, as we all in our everyday lives keep information private, is obviously uh, not a helpful uh, verb to use. Eric Schmidt from Google um, said on the matter, uh, if you have, but he basically said words to the effect of, uh, if you have something you want to hide, should you really be doing it? <coughs> On the face of it, that, that could maybe be a convincing argument, especially if you're thinking uh, in terms of um, the kinds of case studies <coughs> that, are, that we're frequently given, the, the justifications for mass surveillance, uh, terrorism, fighting paedophilia. Um, but given that the information is kept from all of us, um, I don't think that that <coughs> follows. It would mean to say that um, if you don't want everyone to know your sexuality, then you shouldn't have your sexuality. Uh, if you don't want everyone to know that you're fighting an addiction, you shouldn't have an addiction. Um, so the, the principle doesn't follow at all. Privacy is obviously something that we care about and that we need and that we do use in our everyday lives in different contexts. Um, nothing to hide, nothing to fear. What, what is there to fear? What is the problem? with the information uh, that's being collected and that will be under the Investigatory Powers Bill should it go through. Um, <clears throat> I think as Percy mentioned, it's worth looking at other countries um, who have abandoned uh, the right to privacy and the and historical precedent. Um, and normally, when governments uh, and nation states do that or when they engage in uh, mass surveillance or broad surveillance techniques, they're normally not going down a very good path. Um, and that's something that might be uncomfortable for us to consider here, but something that I think we really must. Um, what direction could we be going in? Um, but moreover, what direction would this legislation allow us to go in? And that's the, that's the, that's the question that we really ask, especially in the context of, of rights, which are supposed to draw those red lines around our democracy. Um, another thing that is important to consider, um, that I, I mentioned earlier, we, it, this isn't only about ourselves, it's about the specific groups that are at risk. Um, we've already seen the availability of data on everyone be misused. Um, I'm talking particularly about journalists and their sources. Um, we've seen a few examples already that we know of 
I'm sure there are many more that we don't know of, unfortunately, um, where the police have accessed um, data to uncover journalistic sources. Uh, it's, it's kind of being seen as a shortcut for police, in, police investigative work. Um, there is, in my mind, absolutely uh, no reason that the Investigation Powers Bill shouldn't put in place uh, PACE protections um, that would normally be used for journalistic materials, certain guidelines around uh, whether or not you can access journalist, uh, journalistic uh, communications and communications data. Um, I would... Um, take Theresa May's promises of protections for journalists and MPs and lawyers and so on with a pinch of salt because I've read the legislation um, and anyone who's read it will tell you that the safeguards um, are absolute rubbish unfortunately and they're going to be no use in practice as they currently stand at all or at least of very little use. Um, it's not just uh, journalists, lawyers and MPs historically who have had uh, data collected in, and used uh, against them. It's also um, politicians abroad, of course, uh, we all know about Angela Merkel's phone. Um, charities, um, Amnesty International being one of them, but there are many more. Um, and even uh, NSA analysts' love interests uh, must be very tempting as an analyst to have the communications of everyone at your fingertips. Um, and unfortunately that's been abused before to, um, from Snowden documents that, that we know of. Um, I often use the example um, of misuse of information or the importance of information. Um, in, in the discussion about the importance of information, I often use the example of the Lawrence family, um, who, as you know, uh, as you probably know, had an undercover police officer um, within uh, spending time with their family under uh, a, a false pretense that they were there to collect information on the family. Um, there was another example in the news last night that you might have seen, uh, a, a horribly similar example of undercover policing gone very wrong. Now the Investigatory Powers Bill uh, doesn't cover um, undercover policing, unfortunately. I think it would have been nice if it, if it had. Um, However, the reason that I think it's a relevant example is uh, if we think about how that, would, that situation would have uh, unraveled today and with today's technology and with today's communications, here you had a family who I think um, would never have imagined that their information, the information on them would become valuable, but it did, um, and not through any political um, activism, uh, not through uh, being a politician or a journalist or a lawyer, um, but through being the victims of an unforeseeable horrific crime. Um, suddenly the fact that some family members and friends went to uh, some protests several years before became very valuable uh, to people who wanted to undermine them. So of, of course information is power um, and having information, a repository of information on everyone is not a healthy thing to have in a democracy. There's another part of the question um, which I'll, t I'll try to be brief. Um, aside from the principled arguments about why privacy matters and about why uh, mass surveillance is a bad thing, um, there's a, a question of um, how does it work in practice? Does it actually keep us safe? Well, one of the reasons that Edward Snowden um, left and blew the whistle was because he had uh, grave concerns about how these bulk powers were actually working in practice. Uh, the same is true of Chelsea Manning. The same is true of Thomas Drake from the NSA and William Binney from the NSA. Um, there is a whole <coughs> group of uh, intelligence whistleblowers who have left the agencies over this issue and who all report that analysts are burdened with data. That it doesn't matter how good your analytic programs are and your algorithmic processing is, um, you, programs such as that will always produce false positives. Statistically, that is a truth. Um, so, especially when 
it is highly likely that this data is being processed in a discriminatory way, the risk of false positives, of uh, highlighting someone as suspicious and deserving further investigation, the risks are enormous um, and something that unfortunately, if we continue to go down this road, I can only imagine <coughs> will rear its head as a future problem for us and for our law enforcement to deal with. Um, interestingly, um, the whistleblower I mentioned, uh, William Binney from the NSA, he was the former technical director of the NSA. He developed a system that did sift global signals, global communications, but didn't collect. Uh, it would only collect with specific selectors or, or targets um, based on people who are known suspects and their social networks. So out of all the global noise of communications, it pulled in a small but rich repository of data that could be dealt with by analysts. Um, in comparison to uh, the NSA's uh, other programs that were being developed in the at the time, this is between the late 90s and, and uh, up to 2001, it was relatively cheap. I believe it cost about $9 uh, million. Um, in the grand scheme of things, is isn't isn't that much. However, uh, the program was stopped um, a couple of months before 9-11. It was stopped around August, uh, I think it was around August 2001, um, in favour of a much greater uh, idea, which was the bulk collection, um, upstream collection of global signals. Um, at the cost of, it's estimated around $4 billion, uh, was the estimated cost of running that program. Whilst that program was running, um, as we all know, traumatically, 9-11 happened. Uh, the system did not pick up any intelligence on the perpetrators. However, the targeted system, collecting dust, sidelined by the agency, had collected actionable intelligence on the perpetrators of 9-11. Uh, I think it's an absolute travesty that a political, what I think was to some extent a political decision over whether to do targeted surveillance um, with modern technologies or bulk surveillance and collect everything, in part led to that travesty being missed. Um, and here we find ourselves with the Investigatory Powers Bill and bulk powers um, again, uh, short, soon to be codified uh, in, into British uh, legis legislation. At liberty, of course, we're, we're fighting this and doing everything we can to make it the best piece of legislation that it could be. Given how bad it currently is, uh, that's a bit of a, um, a, a difficult task, uh, to put it lightly. Um, but uh, in the policy team, we are lobbying MPs. <coughs> I would encourage any of you who um, feel similarly to us about the issue to lobby yours um, and let them know that you, that you care about it. That really is important. We also have um, a case um, at the CJEU, which will soon be heard, um, in the case of uh, Davis and Watson, the two MPs, on bulk communications data retention. We think that that will um, confirm that collecting uh, bulk data is unlawful, and that could have, uh, implicate, uh, that could have uh, effect across all of Europe, not just here. And uh, at the moment, that is our, our light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully. So thank you very much indeed. So um, concluding plea to all of you to contact your own teams and <laughs> act on behalf of Liberty to make sure that you can be active in the defense of the of our work in the race. Judith, um, if you'd like to please slightly regret taking on this task. There's <laughs> <laughs> such a rich amount of information there and I don't think I need to repeat you know, what's been said because it's been put so clearly and um, so eloquently already. I suppose there are just a few 
themes, sort of key themes that emerge that I thought I'd maybe draw attention to, and then hopefully that will lead into the discussion that we have afterwards. I mean, hearing from Kirsty on the, the history of this, and it's clear that we were well overdue um, reform here, and I don't think anyone's arguing against that. And as, as Sophie pointed out, we need more substantial, better legislation um, that sets things out very clearly. Um, and there clearly have been so many problems um, to date. It's sort of astonishing to think, you know, uh, in terms of the, the IPT, that it's taken this long for there to be a ruling you know, against the, the, the security services. Um, I thought one point in, is thinking about the historical context, that difference between the UK and the US is really key to draw out. And I wonder if we might discuss that a little bit more about it later on. Um, thinking about why the UK is so reluctant to talk explicitly uh, about certain approaches and mechanisms that it's using, um, and, and whether really a case can be made that this is a national security risk. You know, often this it's just used as a very sort of vague and loose term. We really don't understand exactly what the test is uh, and what the empirical <coughs> evidence for something actually being a national security risk by revealing certain information. I think that's something we I'd, I'd welcome more clarity on. Um, Uh, and we, and we heard about the, these judgments and the Pyrrhic victory, and this is law. You know, it's very fascinating reading, reading to follow. In terms of transparency and oversight, um, I think that was really good to have so much attention drawn drawn to that. Um, and there's been so much discussion around that in the bill, whether the mechanisms in the bill as it stands are adequate for the, the judicial commissioner review, as opposed to sort of the full judicial authorization model that might be better, um, people in many quarters would argue. Um, we heard this, uh, Kirsty I think mentioned you know, the argument that people think that judges are too slow and I think you said it was nonsense and actually that's a very robust process for them to be put through. So I think that's something that could be discussed more um, and certainly as it's going through the house in its current form. Um, Kirsty mentioned the, sort of the importance of accessibility and foreseeability of law and that's something that, um, it just reminded me of something that Graham Smith um, a solicitor who works in this area, and is, um, I recommend you read his blog, Cyber Legal, has talked about. And he said that the bill would have been a very real opportunity for increasing transparency in this area. And he's very worried about secret legal interpretations of the law and how do we know how things are actually, for example, in relation to external communication that we've mentioned, how is that actually being interpreted? And he said that you could put mechanisms in place to make sure that these things are, are, are communicated more transparently, and that would fit very much this, you know, uh, the importance of having it ex accessible and foreseeable um, law. Um, journalistic sources were mentioned as well, I think it relates to the oversight point, um, very worrying. I think, I think it was clause 61 in the original bill and now clause 68, and we still have an issue about whether an organisation would be alerted to the fact that a warrant is being apl uh, um, applied for so that the media organisation would have no opportunity as it currently stands to actually um, make a representation against a, a, warrant, being a, a, a warrant application. <coughs> um, we talked, uh, we heard a bit about sort of public views and what your why privacy is important and I think you know, lots of things are said about what the British public thinks and often we're very reliant on national media uh, telling us what the public thinks and I mean, clearly there, I mean, Snow, the whole S Snowden uh, revelations have shown that there is great, a great deal of public interest in this. Um, there are obviously distinctions, with, you know, we're not Germany in the same historical context and that maybe there is a sort of a, a certain laissez-faire attitude or a sort of people aren't um, so worried about their data being collected and stored in certain ways, but I think that's a, some, something to really discuss um, and think about ways that we can draw attention to um, to the potential dangers. I mean, the, the Lawrence example was a really interesting one to draw out, I think, right? we see uh, where someone is sort of just incidentally drawn into being a public figure and that you might be targeted in ways that you might not expect otherwise. Um, and then Sort of the final theme I might mention, sort of thinking about the future of the legislation. Um, Silky said it's not the right piece of legislation, but I mean, I, I think from practically speaking, this is going through now. Um, so you also said you're just trying to make it the best piece of legislation it, it can be. So I guess we need to think about that quite pragmatically. Um, so I suppose it might be interesting to hear a bit more about what features you think the legislation should have that it doesn't have already. So I think that's probably our stuff. Um, I'd like to invite you both to, to respond to Judith's comments before we open it to questions from the floor. Sophie, do you want to reflect on any remarks that she made? Um, 
Yes. Sorry, um, sorry I, I answered you anything. <laughs> um, uh, well, first of all, a fantastic summary. Uh, <laughs> wow, did, was that all really, really out there? And um, I, I think actually, what is interesting, I mean, I find it very interesting in terms of how the U.S. dealt with with um, these revelations, how the U.K. did, um, and the neither confirm nor deny approach by the security services. I mean, it's it, there's a few judgments now where uh, high court judges are saying um, that the the security services have to take on board that uh, this isn't a flag that they can just wave and that the courts will then stand by and salute. Uh, and be because that's the default position. Now, it seems to me that perhaps in this country we had more faith in our institutions, that our institutions are robust enough to actually take an acceptance of this is a data collection program, yes it does exist, and let's have a conversation about it. Now why in that situation we couldn't have a straightforward confirm it exists uh, as, as happened in the States and then there was a huge amount of um, upset and a lot of flack that happened to, to the politicians and so on. Um, but it seems to me to be almost like a lack of faith in, in the institutions to, to, to adopt um, the policy we do. I, I, obviously I can see why in many cases in um, it, it, in terms of sensitive material and, and the explanation was put forward in the IPT as to um, why they can't they can't move it at all even though it d doesn't seem to make any sense but um, my position on that, their default position is incorrect um, in terms of oversight uh, yes Dave, David Anderson's uh, oversight proposals um, as have been picked up in the bill those of you interested in lobbying and interested in taking this further I'd agree that's where there needs to be a lot of concentration and there is this issue we've still got this slide up there <coughs> on judicial commissioners vis-a-vis um, -vis senior judges um, obviously uh, I heard that this issue with judges being too slow I heard actually a very senior um, politicians saying on the Today program, well, the ticking bomb scenario, um, etc., you can't get sufficient oversight. Um, but that doesn't actually stand up to any scrutiny. Emergency applications happen all the time on uh, a telephone basis with senior judges, and they work perfectly well. And it was very difficult to think of any scenario um, where that could not work. Um, I mean, that's why they're, they're called emergency applications. They can happen very quickly, so that, that could come in. Uh, it was actually Lord Carlisle who uh, was pushing back against um, that on the Today programme. Uh, in terms of uh, why it took so long, um, I agree. One suggestion by David Anderson was that the uh, ISC, the, um, one of the oversight bodies, should, be a, should actually have some ability to make known or, or make more transparent uh, to others that they have an option to complain uh, and perhaps there's, there's some difficulty with people not knowing enough about the IPT hopefully that's uh, now not the position because there's certainly been enough conferences and, and debates uh, such as uh, such as this um, I think just one other point I would like to just take on the general privacy issue which Silky has spoken about um, uh, and where we're heading. I, I do a lot of work in Colombia and there in terms of hacking of uh, communications, um, there it, 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 it hit a point where it's extremely prolific and was almost, and we fact was accepted with a, a lot of people within Congress that their communications would be intercepted. Now their security services, their sort of equivalent of MI5, was called DAS. And DAS had a very important role to play in uh, implementing protective measures which had been passed by the Inter-American Commission. Uh, so, for example, uh, people working in human rights, human rights lawyers, for example, were given protective <coughs> measures by the Inter-American Court and Commission. 
And then DAS would provide the security, so the bulletproof car, um, the driver, uh, and any other security that, that was required, quite often including the telephone. Uh, and then the scandal um, erupted that, in fact, what DAS was doing, or elements of DAS was doing, was they were collecting data on those they were meant to be protecting, and that data was being handed to paramilitaries who were drawing up a death list and there were then a number of death threats which were coming and when all these files were disclosed as they were during a, a, a prosecution uh, it showed there was a uh, huge amounts of interception um, including secret surveillance of actually a lot of my friends who who I work with uh, in Colombia a, a lot of the lawyers particularly for an organization called Cajal in Bogota so it was fairly chilling as to when the power was there, the technology is there, and how easy it is to abuse. And the, the, the upshot of that in terms of Colombia actually functioning quite well within the rule of law was that the head of the director of DAS was uh, prosecuted and convicted for um, uh, collaborating with paramilitaries and he received a very long period of imprisonment and DAS has subsequently been disbanded. But this is literally in the last five years that all of this has happened. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, Sophie, do you have any comments on Judith's remarks? Uh, I will briefly. Um, <coughs> I would agree that um, the oversight mechanisms are very important. We would always be unhappy with and challenge uh, bulk powers, the mass surveillance powers. Um, they can never be human rights compliant. Um, however, um, by any measure, having good oversight mechanisms of how any surveillance is done is very important. Unfortunately, in the bill, that's a missed opportunity in the bill, in the bill that's currently going through Parliament. We've got judicial commissioners who will authorise warrants, uh, who are appointed by the Prime Minister, funded by uh, the Home Secretary. Um, and who will both authorise warrants and oversee um, the, the warrants that are issued. So they will also do, um, as well as doing the authorisation, they will also do the oversight. In other words, marking their own homework to some extent. Um, so unfortunately, um, that is an area that, will, that requires um, basically redrafting, but we'll have to go for it in terms of uh, amendments to the legislation to try and get something that actually does inspire public trust. Um, there are lots <coughs> more ideas I, I have about how to make the bill better, um, but that would be, that would be one of them. Okay. Thank you very much indeed.